Let us pray. Gracious God, your word is it's rich and it's full of so much. And we hunger for it and we need it and we try to understand it. And there's much in this story that is involved and complicated and, and hard even. We ask for hope this day and every day from your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The poet Maya Angelou, she wrote this. Hate. Hate has caused a lot of problems in the world, but has not yet solved a single one. Hatred, when you step back and you look at the broad narrative of the Bible, hatred is at the center of the entire biblical narrative, beginning with the brotherly hatred and anger of, of Cain and Abel, and continuing all the way through to the hatred and the anger that led to Jesus Christ being put up on that cross. Sadly, as history will attest, among the many causes of hatred and anger, ethnic or racial differences or tribal differences are usually the most dangerous. The great story of Queen Esther, a Jew who became the queen of Persia, is about ethnic hatred. It's the story of an anti-Semitic genocide plot that is thwarted. Today we have already briefly talked about the four main characters in the story. Ah Ahasuerus, the mighty king of this great, this great and gigantic kingdom of Persia, the new power, the dominant power in much of the civilized world. And Haman, the king's right-hand man. And Mordecai, who was a Jew living in Persia, and his younger cousin Esther, who was an orphan, who Haman, or excuse me, who Mordecai raised, raised his own cousin like a father. Mordecai and Esther, the heroes of the story. They were part of what's called the Jewish diaspora. Part of a community of Jewish exiles who were, it's now at this point, about a hundred years after the original exile of the Jews from Jerusalem. And they had dispersed. That's where the word disp diaspora comes from. They dispersed through more broadly and now they were in the case of Esther and Mordecai, they were in the city of Susa, the capital of Persia. King Ahasuerus, he ruled over this empire, an empire that went, as the beginning of the story says, all the way from India to Ethiopia, and therefore it probably included all of the Jews in the world. And this king, you don't get to see it in, in our reading. There's plenty of things you don't see in our reading. So reading the entire story is, it fills in a lot of the beauty behind it, some of which we'll capture here. But this king is an incredibly vain and very malleable guy, but especially vain. And he's petty. This man who's petty, and as ridiculous as this sounds, the queen before Esther was basically deposed or removed from being queen because she wouldn't dance in public for the king. And now the king needs to look for a new queen. And so he conducts this search throughout the entire kingdom, sending out his minions to scour the empire for, for, and, and bring back to him the most beautiful women who, who he could choose from. Esther was among those large group of women who were selected, at which point Mordecai, her, her cousin, tells her, gives her this advice to not let anyone know she's Jewish. Anti-Semitism was rife. 
Esther ultimately wins this sort of odd competition and is selected queen. Meanwhile, a very unfortunate incident happens. Mordecai, it's the, it's the incident that triggers, in, in a way, the whole thing, that triggers the anti-Semitism to rise to the surface into hatred. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman, a very also vain and egotistical man. He refuses to bow down to the king's right-hand man. And so this self-important Haman, he is mortally offended. It's amazing how petty the roots of hatred can be. He's mortally offended. He goes to the king and complains about Mordecai and all of the Jewish people who seem to care more for their own laws than they do the laws of the great king. And Haman, with a little monetary incentive, you sort of heard a little bit of that in the reading, convinces the king that Mordecai should be put to death, but not only Mordecai, all of his people. This is a true genocide, the ultimate danger of hatred. As this great nightmare is looming, Mordecai is able to get word to Esther about Haman's terrible plan, which we, that's what we see unfolding in the first reading today, which had become, had been stamped into law. It was going to happen. Not knowing what else to do, Mordecai is desperate. And so he tries to convince Esther that as queen, she is in a unique position to try to thwart this plan. And at first, Esther, knowing and fully understanding how fickle this king is, she's reluctant. After all, the Nobody, including the queen, was even allowed into his presence without some special request being approved and the pointing of the scepter at the person. But Mordecai persists. He persists, warning Esther that she too was going to be a casualty. But then he, use, he uses words. Words, words matter. He uses words that Jews celebrate to this very day in the great feast, every year in the great feast of Purim. He says, and I paraphrase, maybe, just maybe, Esther, you've been able to become, against all odds, you've been able to become queen for just such a time as this. For just such a time as this. Suddenly she's transformed and sees that this is indeed her time to do something about that. And she hatches this plan, which we see parts of. It's clever. She's clever. She's courageous. If I perish, she's willing to take the risk. If I perish, I perish. She sees the king's vanity. And so it's sort of hidden in our reading today. She actually throws two, she, this is her plan, she throws two banquets to take advantage of the king's vanity. And the, the banquets are so wonderful, apparently, and they're so pleasing to the king that he promises her to do whatever she wants. She's ready. The plan has worked. And so she says, admitting who she is, admitting who her people are. She says there's this evil man who has plotted to kill my cousin and plotting to kill my cousin Mordecai, plotting to kill all of my people, including me, because I too. The implications, of course, that she too was Jewish. And the king is furious. Who would possibly do this? Who is this man who would possibly want to kill my beloved queen? My king, he's right over there. Your right-hand your right hand man, Haman. And so it's curtains for Haman, who is hung. Let's call it like it is. He's hung in the same gallows that he had planned to use. 
to hang Mordecai. And the Jewish people are saved. It's hard, hard story. But also rich and powerfully told with real nuance and additional twists and turns that I didn't include, but, but and some of which, by the way, are very disturbing. But when you sum up the whole story, when all is said and done, Esther, what she's done is she has saved God's chosen people through her courage and her cleverness. This ancient story with implications many times in history as Pastor Moira alluded to. And so maybe that makes us want to pivot to how to ask, how should we take this ancient story, how should it impact us in our current time? What are we to take from Esther for this time, for our time? From What are we supposed to take from this woman who was at first and understandably reluctant to step into the breach, but who found not only her courage, but her her. her great ability to outwit murderous hatred. Another way to ask that question might be, what hatreds and angers are relevant in our time? And what might be our role in addressing those? Which, of course, sparks a lot of questions. Questions like, do we really, do we wonder, can we really make a difference? Or are we worried that what we might do will have consequences that won't necessarily be good for us? Or do we even, can we even agree on what the problem that we want to solve is or how we're going to go about it? Or should we just all go about not doing it collectively, but doing it individually? All of these are good questions. And they're really the tip of the iceberg. But as I thought back to those great, great words that motivated Esther to confront hatred and prompted her to do what she did, it prompted me to ask what I think is maybe an even more focused question. What is it about right now, right now, what angers and hatreds seem to be on people's minds and in their hearts the most what angers do we most need to deal with right now the answer to that is of course complicated but there is something that i hear a lot i hear every day i hear it on tv I read about it in the newspaper. I see it online. It's inescapable, it feels like. But also, and this is really important, I hear it from so many people, and and I'd be shocked if, if you don't hear this, from so many people. And that is the the, the anger that we experience across our political divide. anger that very often it sometimes it starts to feel like it's morphing towards hatred and 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 sometimes it feels like people some of the words some of the rhetoric that's used not just in the political spectrum but in in day-to-day conversation it starts to feel a little bit like the other side or, or people can be like enemies Divisions between us that seem to infect almost everything. And I, I mean that actually literally. Everything seems to get politicized. Now look, of course, it's obvious to say that this is a huge issue with complicated reasons for it. And complicated solutions, no doubt as well. And it's one that we can perhaps delve into in more depth in another time. But for today, let me just simply say this. 
among our Lord Jesus Christ's many statements, two in particular come to mind and seem especially relevant for just such a time as this. Blessed are the peacemakers and love your neighbors, including loving your enemies. How do we as individual Christians and as a church make an impact? As peacemakers, I think the answer is as peacemakers and finding ways to love, especially with those with whom we disagree. For such a time as this, it seems that as Christians we are called to be calmers of the waters, which does not mean that we need to agree on everything. Of course not. That's impossible. That's not the way we were created. We were created different. But for such a time as this, it means that we have to love regardless. Now, of course, different times call for different solutions and different courses of action. And, of course, we don't face exactly what Esther and Mordecai faced. But what we face is important in this time. And it seems to be, it sure feels like, maybe the defining issue of the day. And Christ's words give us maybe our own clever game plan to deal with it. One further thing to note in closing. I think we all know this. We say it on every new member Sunday, which is coming up. Plymouth is a church with an unusually wide spectrum of theological and political beliefs. Friends, with that in mind, friends, know this. But that for such a time as this, that is a strength that we can build on. Amen.